our, our, our guest speaker tonight is, uh, is Lisa Stone, who's the founder of Blogger. Um, uh, an interesting thing about Blogger is when it first came along, I, I, I remember thinking, why do, we, why do we need this? And then it got huge. So it showed how wrong I was about that, along with many other things. It's quite a, quite a successful enterprise. And, uh, and Lisa has, uh, has quite a long and, and interesting history that uh, she'll put to use here. I don't want to say too much, but it is using more. So um, without, um, if I missed anything, anybody who's watching here, I just want to make sure that we're back in the first place. Okay. 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 Okay.
enforcement can get. More action. This is the opportunity in front of us with Women Online today. I say act, not write, deliberately. Today, women are using blogs and social sites in a way that extends far beyond the blog as personal printing press metaphor, uh, which as a journalist is the reason I first became so excited about it. I'm talking about behavioral evolution, which can be good and bad if you're trying to get the support of these women. If you strike the right nerve, you'll be rewarded as Dove's Real Beauty campaign was when they launched the time and lapse video on YouTube showing a normal woman being morphed into an unattainable supermodel uh, via Photoshop. More magazine earned kudos when Jamie Lee Curtis stripped down to her skivvies, left off the makeup, and was photographed as a pretty real, normal-looking, 40-something woman. Uh, Brawny, paper towels, built a hilarious site around a fictitious male hero who instantly solves a woman's product, just like Brawny's product, uh, and earned hearts and, and flowers from many women who sent it to my inbox. Um, although I don't think any of them have yet to find a construction worker who builds her an armoire in a day to make sure that she has, has a, good, a good evening. Um, and this action, women are blogging, is certainly not just commercial. Philanthropy and political action are the name of the game for women online this year more than ever. I realize many people, many women in this room, in fact, are involved with pioneering efforts such as Global Voices Online and the Sunlight Foundation. But what I'm talking about is bloggers uh, doing what consumer marketing experts or both campaign managers might consider very different fields. I'm talking about food bloggers led by a blog called Shape Him, who for the past three years have been raising thousands of dollars for children internationally by rash, rash, uh, raffling off their expertise uh, via an initiative called Menu for Health. I'm also talking about things like mamacrafts.com, which is a site that was originally founded by John Edwards supporters, who, when he left the race, have grown to develop a group discussion by Democrats and Republicans and independents uh, who are blogging the election and talking policy. Also, through Blog Her and many other sites, um, many women have invested time in the past year to blog and help on their senators about Senate Bill 529, the Mother's Act. This is groundbreaking legislation aimed at researching the causes of postpartum depression and making sure that resources exist to help educate mothers and their families about the <coughs> risk of very deadly disease. Now, women blogging this initiative know the names of its backers, Senators Menendez and Durbin, and I assure you, we won't forget them. These are wins in the blog first sphere. And just a few examples of how, if you strike the right tone, Women who blog will reward you, your issue, your candidate, your product. If, however, you miscommunicate with women in this medium, you can do damage to your brand, whether you're running for president or trying to sell coffee. Uh, before we open up the discussion, the question and debate, I'd like to give you two examples from the past year of how brands hurt themselves by failing to understand where women are going, both online and off. One of my favorite uh, least favorite examples is the response of the blogger community to the news that presidential candidates have continually declined to answer 12 policy questions developed by our community. These are questions on four major areas, health care, Iraq, the economy, and the environment. Last July, 800 women got together in Chicago, and of those eight for our annual conference, 200 of us got in a room and hammered out 12 questions that fit into these four categories based upon pre-conference survey we've done of hundreds of women. Um, and we decided to reach out to every campaign with an offer to do an on-camera video blog interview um, between a candidate and a blogger from their party. Um, since July, no one has accepted. Instead, we've received two offers to feature candidate spouses, both wives, no first husbands. Uh, the Barack Obama campaign uh, began a grassroots outreach effort of their own called Women for Obama, very much aimed at discussing policy and getting the vote out. The Hillary Clinton campaign also launched a new site of its own called Moms for Hillary. On this site, the Clinton campaign offered the opportunity to win a mom's night out with two former social secretaries of Hillary's who would talk about the candidate's special family traditions and provide campaign choice. Candidate Clinton's health care plan was the only public policy linked to this site or from this site in December when we did the survey. Since then, the site has since added education and economy. So in December, I decided, who am I to turn down an interview with a potential first lady without the permission of the community? So we 
asked bloggers community about whether or not they wanted us to continue trying to talk to the candidates or whether or not speaking with their families and supporters would be adequate, or did they want both? We also asked women for these and their communities in websites, and the response of the community was pretty overwhelming via a poll, site comments, and also private emails. Nearly 65% of respondents said that they wanted bloggers to speak only for the candidates, 29% were eager to have us interview both, and 2.6% said spouses and supporters were adequate. As for the Moms for Hillary uh, website, and to a lesser degree, Women for Obama, 82% were either turned off by these efforts or had a recommendation to change their approach. 18.4% liked these sites. While the survey comments we received are as diverse as the women who make up the majority of internet users and American voters, across the board, bloggers who took the survey, and again, bloggers a nonpartisan organization that has a wildly on the partisan group of women on its, it, it, in the 8 million we reach every month. Um, but they, they asked candidates and campaigns to do three things, to take uh, women online, quote unquote, seriously, to stop, quote unquote, patronizing women online, and or, quote unquote, pandering women voters. Here are a couple of representative quotes, and by representative I mean that they represent 20 or more of the comments that we received. Uh, number one, quote, if you want to reach women, particularly moms, you have to come to them, especially online. By doing it your way, i.e. on your own websites, if you're doing your campaign a disservice, you show that you're out of touch with where women are and what they care about. Here's another quote. I want to know where you as a candidate for president stand. Not where you think I want you to stand, but exactly what your opinions are on Iraq, the economy, education, and health care. And here are a roundup about this, particularly the Moms for Hillary site. Um, not all women are mothers are married. Hello. <laughs> Next quote. Fine idea, poor execution. Do moms require exclamation points? Because I sort of thought we were interested in family-friendly social policy more than by exciting, exclamation point, nights, exclamation point, out, exclamation point, <laughs> friends, exclamation point, end quote. What's so ironic about this example to me is that ever since Senators Clinton and Obama announced in the same week in January 2007 that they were running for office, I have seen more excitement and interest in a presidential campaign on blogs by women that have nothing to do with public policy, blogs on which I have never even seen current events even discussed. I'm talking about crap blogs and food blogs and some of the parenting blogs that don't go there and MySpace blogs that are just very personal what I did today. These are women outside the political blogging echo chamber. They are becoming engaged and excited about this election when they are able to have a conversation about it with the people they care about, not just receive and regurgitate messaging about it. What's more, given the opportunity to engage in civil disagreement and fierce debate about even the most uh, heated topics, we have found that women will do so if the right environment is created. So in the past year, Blogger has come up with a couple of experiments helping our community agree to disagree and find common ground. Um, we put up uh, columns such as why I am pro-life, why I am pro-choice, right next to each other, and had people mix it up. We dug way into embryonic stem cell research when that was a hot issue in Missouri. We also uh, have taken on gay marriage. We've also taken on versus gender in the campaign. Yet the candidates want to engage with an archetype of these voters and in a scenario where they carefully control the terms and the environment. And I have some recommendations about this, but first I want to give you another example. This one is doubtless much better known, and so forgive me if I'm repeating something that some of you know, um, but I'm talking about the breastfeeding wars that have tarnished Delta and Freedom Airlines, Starbucks, and ultimately Facebook with women who blog. In each of these cases, the businesses at hand made a decision to ask breastfeeding women to leave their establishments, resulting in blog stores, boycotts, and a very red face for these brands. The most recent of these is Facebook. Uh, in September 2007, Facebook closed a woman's account uh, and posted a note, and we covered it on blogger.com. We don't always break news. We break news perspective every single day. Um, but this was one where we made quite a story. The note read, Hi, Karen. After reviewing your situation, we determined you violated our terms of use. Please note, nudity, drug use, or other obscene content is not allowed on the website. Additionally, we do not allow users to send threatening, obscene, and harassing messages. Unsolicited messages will also not be tolerated. We will not be able to reactivate your account for any reason. This decision is final. Thanks for understanding. And <laughs>
Customer support representative, Facebook. Karen's <coughs> breastfeeding photographs were not on her home page, of her Facebook page. They were behind a link that said breastfeeding photos. It did not go unnoticed by the moms on Facebook that paternity parties were being held to a different standard. <coughs> Hypocrisy identified, a blog storm ensued. Today, the Facebook group, Hey Facebook, breastfeeding is not a scene, has 38,853 members. That's today's count. And the blog, Facebook Sucks, started by the League of Eternal Justice.com, still exists. That's not just a blown commercial opportunity. Facebook immaculately conceived its own ex-customer vendetta. What a shame. As soon as Facebook opened up to those of us outside the college years, women in the blog were all over it. These are women who were looking for a Latter-day yearbook. We were looking for a virtual ladies' room wall on which to write each other, as well as on our blogs, especially one that helped us reach out to our male readers, to the men in our lives, and to our colleagues at work. Um, we're talking about, particularly in the case of women who blog, a constituency for whom the internet is a lifeline. We expected to have to silence our own voices in order to give our children theirs. But the blog is fair, set us free. To be rejected for one among many women is considered a massive accomplishment. To be told that what you're doing is obscene after nine months of heart baking, finally getting your little baby to stop screaming and eat after you've invested what little spare time you have in a community to set up a profile while selectively ignoring the <coughs> online players? Those. So there are a few lessons I take for this, and I'd really love to hear your thoughts when I'm done. First, I think that we should pause and reflect ten years ago the Birth Center didn't exist. And the status quo opinion I heard when I left CNN uh, to the short pit stop of web TV and then went on to women.com, so women would never go online. So it's really nice to have that faith out of the way. Now, I think we should look at the numbers. Women's interests and behaviors do not fit into discrete pink and purple silos. The domestic diva, the soccer mom, the sex and the city single, these are all labels that I'm sure many of us have seen apply to women at one point or another. And these are just not keeping up with the social media time. Women today are as interested in discussing our choice of candidates as we are discussing which blogging platform we like, our choice of dog food, and what money market fund we're going to use to try to protect the kids' educations. The problem is not women online because we are perfectly comfortable with all our personalities and all of our lives. The problem is, all too often, applying decades-old ingrained behaviors and techniques for messaging and selling, and mixing these archaic approaches with stereotypes of female interaction, all of which falls flat when sprayed out via new conversational Technologies. The result leaves money, political change, brilliant thinkers, and technological innovation on the table. And I would argue that we can't afford to lose the support of these women. Let's change that. And let's start by taking the advice of women who blog. So forget push media, direct dial, precinct blocking, phone banking, and now in name Twitter messages from candidates. Instead, let's build on town hall meetings and have true voter to voter conversations where candidates can cut out the middleman or woman, I say, as a former journalist, uh, now blogger, and go straight to the voter and anyone who wants to sell direct to the consumer. There are four main themes that emerge from our voter survey, and I think they apply as well to consumer brands as they do to presidential candidates. Um, theme number one was reach out to established women's networks. Don't create your new ones. Reach women where they're already going. Don't read them to wheel. The second one was Please stop marketing to women and start talking with women. The methods that you have for doing this will change with the technology. Why don't you start by hiring women from the community and the market and the demographic you're trying to reach? They're incredible experts out there. And they start at right around age 11. Don't separate women out as moms or singles, or worse, a monolithic single block that thinks and votes and buys Sex, style, parenthood, and politics to live and work side by side in our brains and in our wallets. Please don't archetype us unless you're going to work with us to come up with ones. Please work with us to find common ground or you will lose votes and dollars. In today's world, the only thing harder than being a mother is being a woman who hasn't yet exercised her ovarian rights or has decided not to. You will never hear you. Meet the new so-called women's issues. That was theme number four. Today, seriously, the biggest single issue I know with any woman alive is health care. Um, 
and on, on the higher side. Of course, as you can see from blogger.com, we cover everything under the sun because women are blogging everything under the sun. Right after healthcare, really truly comes Iraq, the economy, and the environment. But this is a natural constituency for other issues that I know the Berkman Center cares about, and it is one of the reasons I care for the Berkman Center. Things like net neutrality, things like the First Amendment, things like the Blogger's Bill of Rights, and things like the chilling effects Mary Mouse, and ultimately things like internet for everyone in every school, no matter what your economic level. So we should use this power. So the question is no longer what do women want. It's not even women, what do you want? It's hi, would you like to talk about what you want? So I think we should start there, and, and I think we have the technology. No, not at all. Um, I think that, unfortunately, and I, I don't know if I made this point that well, um, many, uh, as a result of the, the role that white men play in engineering, now the engineering's often been stereotyped, which is completely unfair as well. It's, it's a gross irony, uh, and, and we should fight it. I, I sort of wonder if maybe the thing to do is to um, consider looking at a way in which to write about this and have some fun with it. Because I've begun to believe that the only approach to effective resolution of, of things like that is either comedy or walking your talk. That's actually, as you and I discussed, how Blogger got started. And so we decided it was at the time that um, Susan Estridge was blowing up Michael Hensley for the LA Times op-ed page and complaining about how there weren't enough women writing op-eds. And I looked hard at that, and my first blog was uh, when I covered the Democratic National Convention for the LA Times. And I decided that instead of um, complaining about it, what we wanted to do was to show the world with metrics, with data, uh, with big meetup. Um, and that has worked with positively, and I'm happy to say that our first volunteer who signed up at, at that conference was a guy. And we still have lots of men in our network.
I'd just like to point out that the mics are on, and it would be really helpful for those of us in the back, if you in the front could use them so that we can hear what you're saying. Thank you. Yes, um, so thank you so much for the great talk. Um, one thing I found in, in my generation in particular for women, the important in politics and uh, you know, other issues, is the notion of, of not necessarily being associated with a network that's identified as women, which is to say that you want to be observed as a blogger, not a female blogger, right. or you want to be, um, I guess, conceived of as having interests that are special somehow or outside of the norm. Uh, I think you see that play out a lot, particularly around uh, debates on Twitter and honor and things like this. And it's a real, I think it's, a, it's, it's definitely a challenging thing for, for people who are interested in these um, issues related to gender, but also don't want to be defined as part of them, and also want to be inclusive. Oh, I think that's a, that's a great question. So, Long Her um, was created as a way in which to create opportunities for women who blog to gain additional exposure, education, community, and now with our ad network, economic empowerment. Men are absolutely part of our community. They are in our ad network. We have some of the best chefs I've ever read in our food network. We have parenting bloggers, we have entertainment bloggers who are men. So it's very open and uh, we have evolved with our community. Um, I think that um, what's interesting is that we continue to ask our community what they want us to do with the gender issues. One of the things that uh, characterizes us right now is that our conferences still represent a female-only speaking roster, and that is at the request of our members. We ask them every year, would you like us to have men speak at the conference? Would you like us to have men speak at the conference? And every year they say, so we're trying to be representative, and their response is typically, we absolutely want men at the conference, we love the men who read our blogs, we're so glad that you link to men from blog her, that men are in your blog roles, that men are in your ad network, but there are so few places where women get to speak about technology and food, or technology and parenting, or technology and whatever, that we really just want to keep it to women for right now. Um, as such, what's interesting is that actually this summer's annual conference, we are going to have a Men of Blog Her Meetup. We're going to have um, a, a little get together just for uh, men who have come to the conference. Um, and I, I anticipate that someday we will have men speak. But it's, a, it's an interesting issue, and I welcome a lot of feedback. What do you think we should do? I'm not sure. I mean, it's just a question that I think, you know, particularly, uh, as I said, in the early campaigns, just because of the questions around. fascinating for me to watch how the community breaks the stereotypes where we have one, I'm going to identify race and demographics just because they pertain to this conversation. We have one white um, female blogger, Erin uh, Kentucky Best, who went and interviewed Maxine Waters, who is a black congresswoman from Southern California. And Erin is an Obama supporter and a representative of Waters has endorsed Clinton. And we put a video blog up on the site. It was really fascinating. Erin went on to ask Hillary Clinton, the police was on the campaign, which led to quite a number of, of comments. But what's interesting, I feel like I'm watching this this community um, sort of break stereotypes all the time, which is valuable to me, uh, because I'm still not seeing, to your point, um, 
the other uh, comment, or Lisa Williams' point about the number of times she hears terms like teenage girl or, or grandma used negatively, um, you know, it's really nice to, to have that. Hi, I'm Christine Morgan, um, Nathan Fellow. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little more, you, you mentioned a few statistics at the top of, of your talk about um, ethnicity and, and international um, reach. Is it all US based? Is it, you know, what, a few things like that, one. And then secondly, can you talk a little bit more about the, the nuts and bolts of the people who are cross posting within Blogger? I mean, how does that work? Is there some kind of a financial relationship? How does that happen? Absolutely. So um, I don't have a ton of uh, racial demographic data um, on our user base right now. Um, but I am happy to say that we are not an all-white site, either in the editors or in the members. Um, our overall demographic is such. We have a uh, median age is 30. 67% of our um, members, uh, and I'm sort of reaching across the entire blogger network. This is on blogger.com and also the 1,400 blogs we, we work with as a publisher. Um, 7% of, of the people we reach are between 25 and 54. We're very specifically for adult women because we don't want to get into the legal ones about Jumbo you deal with when you, when you work with minors. You do have a, a sex and relationships channel. Um, and so you can assume that the remaining 33% are over 54. 72% um, are married, 53% have children. Um, I've shared some of the other statistics. Um, on blogger.com specifically, we have 60 editors who cover 24 different beats. These run the whole gamut of issues that when we ask our bloggers what they're blogging about, they say everything from business and technology and finance and career to food to you know, the arts to, to DIY. 87% um, of the people who come to blogger.com are from the United States. 94% uh, are from the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia, or a classic English language demographic. That said, we have worked very hard to uh, begin to put fingers out into the world um, community. We have a blogger, an Indian blogger, Sphinga Sen, who writes a great deal about Southeast Asian women. Um, we have had bloggers from Italy, from Africa, and we're eager to do more of that. Um, I think that the most important thing that we continue to try to do is um, to raise the profile of members of the community um, in the issues that are really hitting them. So the past year, as you see, the election has been super hot. But in addition, um, the subject of body image has come up again and again and again and again. And so we actually decided to launch a body image channel. And we started a movement <coughs> called Letters to My Body, where we have had more than 200 women write different letters about how they're feeling about themselves. And this isn't just initially how I feel when I look in the mirror, right? It is spread out into women who have survived cancer, women who are blind, women who are infertile. Um, we have a big issue right now for women of color. Um, and so we're just trying to follow the audience where they want us to go, in a way. Now, the nuts and bolts, I should just mention, Blogger is a verbal site. We believe wholeheartedly in open source. We are really excited to be part of excited to be part of the Drupal community, and um, we're all learning code as fast as we can. Um, For those of us who don't know, what's Drupal? Drupal is a content management system. It's open source. You can find it at Drupal.org. You will find there are many other people in here who know a lot more about it than I do, even though we have two sites in it. Um, and um, they just have a huge confidence with it. Here, here, in Boston, yeah. Um, and what's wonderful about it is it's a modular content management system, which means that the community um, creates and delivers different bells and whistles, for lack of a better phrase, that you can plug into your site, and it means you don't have to create a few yourself. Um, it scales enormously, much bigger than Ruby on Rails or, or some of the other sites. Um, and it can be made to look much prettier than I, our current site does, which I take all the blame for. Um, hi, as a, um, now it's on. Um, as a 
full-time journalist. Um, I have found and a semi-blogger. I found this very interesting and um, enlightening. Um, as a full-time journalist, I'm interested, obviously, in the business model of the news business. And I'm, I actually have two questions. One of them is, how many full-time paid staffers with benefits, i.e. health insurance, um, do you have? And, and the second question is more the, 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 of the people that are blogging through blog her. Do you have any data on what they are not doing? What have they, mm -hmm. yes. what have they eliminated from their life in order to have time to do the blogging? Sure, absolutely. Um, and I will an answer a question that was just raised also that, that I didn't get to. Um, uh, so on blogger.com, uh, and let me pull back for a minute. Today, blogger.com is beginning its fourth year. We've incorporated as a business. We have now 22 full-time employees with benefits. We have about um, 10, 15 other critical contractors uh, that we work with on a part-time and as-needed basis. We reach 8 million uniques a month according to the Nielsen at Rating Site Census and deliver a little over 40 million pages a month. We are a 100 million plus impression a month network. For those of you who work with advertising, you can see that we are charting at the top 10 women's network with those numbers. Um, we certainly don't pay uh, our employees what we would like to. We are a fledgling startup with Series A funding from Ben Rock. Um, and we are extremely proud of what this incredible team has accomplished. When you go to the blogger.com homepage, you see just the tip of the network because our 60 editors are paid $50 per post to blog between two and eight times a month, depending upon their agreement with us. They keep all first rights to their work. We keep second rights because we don't want to be ripping it off the site. Um, the editor's posts are the first thing you see. We also invite every member of the network to blog on the network as long as they blog according to our community guidelines. Um, we try to put comments on a par with what the editors are doing as well. Um, and the business model is that we do a revenue share with the 1,400 bloggers in our network. And um, we uh, don't do a revenue share with the advertising on blog production. We also um, started the conferences as a, as a sort of a, a grassroots thing, and they're continuing to be priced at a grassroots level, uh, about $99 a day, except for a big business conference, which is April 34th in New York. Um, and, but they've turned out to be um, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to develop relationships with sponsors that we bring into the network. And the, what, what are people not doing in order to oh. spend time blogging? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that since the internet became the majority medium, people have been running from television, magazines, and newspapers. But what's interesting is that bloggers tend to run to news and information sites, as well as other blogs. So I think what we need to do is figure out how to take this uh, uh, publishing network approach and apply it uh, and other ideas that I'm sure people in this room have to continuing to support the journalism industry that I so love so much. or guidelines for bloggers who wish, wish to have ads on their sites. 
can speak about uh, the status of the program today, accessibility for bloggers, and what plans are for the program going forward? Sure. Um, I'm not sure what restrictions you need, but I can tell you how the program works. Um, if you go to bloggerads.com and you wish to sign up, um, we ask that we be your exclusive rich media provider of graphic advertising above the fold, and by above the fold we mean in the top 768 pixels on your blog. We need to be able to go into our Fortune 1000 advertisers and say, yes, Kraft, yes, GM, yes, AOL, you'll be the only ad banner above the fold with our bloggers, which is why we actually can't say it's okay if our bloggers work with other ad networks as well. So we also um, don't have any limits on traffic or size. What we are looking for is quality. We want people who blog in their uh, topic area two or more times a week because we want these to be active social communities. My personal blog, surfet.typepad.com, would never qualify for our network because I spend too much time blogging on blogger.com. Are there qualifying uh, types of blogs, qualifying topics? Uh, the question is, are there qualifying topics? The only topics that we currently are not accepting are sex blogs. We haven't figured out a way to do that, but we have blogs. If you go to bloggerads.com and you look at the left hand <coughs> corner, you'll see that we're rotating um, national network level advertising on parenting, food, entertainment, health. We're starting networks in business, infertility, politics, um, green, tech, but we're really just sort of getting off the ground on those others. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. We've had about extraordinary growth. Um, last year at this time we reached about a million uniques a month. Today we reach eight million uniques a month. And so 20, 10 or 11 of our 22 employees are in sales. So we're working hard to catch up with the inventory that we have. Um, but our average CPM for parenting is $12. Um, would I throw we should be sold more inventory? Absolutely. Are we sold out? We are not. If anyone has an insertion order they'd like to discuss, please see me out of the talk. Um, we represent some of the best writers on the internet today, and we're just extremely proud because we don't require that you be, have millions and millions of readers. We um, do ask that you be an excellent writer. Yes, sir. You know, I'm a political blogger, and I, from the beginning, it sounds like both parties and the major candidates more or less blew off your concerns and your questions. Do you see them listening now? Is there a chance of seeing some developments by November? Thank you so much for asking. We continue to reach out to the Clinton, Obama, and McCain campaigns and invite them to come and speak on video with a blogger from their political party. From the left, we have we have Maura Aaron Smelly, who's regularly on CNN. On the right, we have Mary Catherine Hamm from townhall.com. We have any number of other political editors as well on the site, uh, if the candidate prefer them. Our 12 questions are on the site. There will be no surprises. We've also decided that we may as well begin to reach out um, and ask them in writing to answer the, the 12 questions in our voter manifesto. And in fact, we've started trying to answer those questions ourselves. Um, we've gone out and taken the question and searched the sites to find out what's on them. And it's been a very interesting um, experience. I know that I was quite clear earlier that Moms for Hillary was a big flop. But what's interesting is that the HillaryClinton.com site does an excellent job with describing exactly what the candidates' blanks are with regard to reproductive health. The word reproductive health does not even appear on the Barack Obama site. And it's a great exercise in poor site organization because if you Google BarackObama.com and Reproductive Health, you find tons of things that are totally hidden from you. But they're on the site. So it's fascinating. Um, we'd love to have them. We invited them and their campaigns to uh, blog her 07 in Chicago where we had 800 women. Uh, we had two campaign send representatives, the McCain campaign and the Clinton campaign. Uh, that was it. And every single one of the candidates from the Democratic side, all seven of them, showed up at Daily Post the next week. So we took that as a, as a clear signal that we needed to try to be a little more active in our pursuit, but we haven't been successful yet. We would love your help. Sam. 
Has any of the campaigns updated the websites targeting and following the block of survey? Um, yes, the original Moms for Hillary link that I connected from my blog in, De in December, December 21st announcing the survey results and now redirects to um, Hillary Clinton's statement on International Women's Day. But if you go to another URL, monsterhillary.com, the site still exists. And since then, she has updated it. And now longer, no longer just links to her healthcare policy, she's already begun to involve some of her educational um, links and her links about economic reform for the middle class. So there has been some movement there. She has yet to open a site for single women. She has yet to open a site targeted at another female demographic that I'm aware of.
Are you trying to get the product tested? Are you trying to get the product adopted? Do you want the product to walk it out? Right? What, what is your plan? Um, because, again, um, we have various different ways in which we can open advertising. If they want to reach out to the 8 million people we reach every month, they can advertise on our blogs. They can offer a product sample out on our 1400 blogs. Or they can take out a placement in special offers, um, which is a section on blogger.com, where they can offer up a free sample. It's all about the sort of customizing, and this is what has really changed about the advertising business. I would say that 40% of the advertising RFPs or requests for proposal that we see ask for some kind of customized um, approach to the user, right? Right? I'm getting nods from the audience. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think they're smart to ask this because we really do know what the habits of these women are. Um, so, um, you know, we can easily talk to them. So, for example, we've had, you know, we've given away hundreds of Disney DVDs for the new Princess DVD. We've had women write in and say why they should be the ones to sample a new Kenneth Cole reaction um, uniform for, for boys, or, or outfit for boys, and those of us who dress little boys, it's really hard to find these I guess, to, um, just to qualify a little bit, are you seeing that the advertisers are thinking differently than the archetypes that they were thinking before when they were approaching your site? It really depends on the advertisers. It used to be that advertisers fell into three camps. Those who were never ever going to advertise on blogs, those who were absolutely running toward the blogs, like, absolutely were going to be very big. They knew they wanted to advertise there, and their goal was just try to reduce your CDM as much as possible. And then people in the middle, they're being told they should do it, they kind of want to do it, now what we're finding is a much more sophisticated approach. They've been in this space for a while, and what they're looking for is moving way beyond the visual impression or the CPM. What they're interested in is adoption. They're interested in authentic interaction with bloggers. They want a reaction of some kind. And so what we try to do is come up with campaigns where they can do that, but still not in order for bloggers doing the original editorial writing that they wanted to do and why they partnered with does that answer your question? Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a bit about uh, open source specifically. Um, it, it sounds like you have a great community, and I was I was uh, curious about how you grew it in the first year or so specifically.
that, does that answer your question? Uh, you know, totally love open source. I wish I had been an engineer. No, I'm not an engineer. So, um, one of the problems that, that has you faced uh, anything like this is, is some sort of financial sustainability. And we, as an organization which spins off um, from time to time, both for profit and non profit entities, but it's always looking for ways to fund these things. Um, think a lot about different strategies for that financial sustainability. And so I'm particularly curious around in, within your transition from a, a nonprofit model to a hey, there's money coming in for you and for the rest of the community. How did you manage the transition? And were there challenges, either ones that you expected would be there and didn't show up, or ones that you didn't expect that did present themselves? Um, That's a great question. So uh, for starters, um, we initially thought hard about being uh, a dot org, in fact, blogger.org was the URL of our first blog. Um, but when the call for an ad network or a better business model came out from the community, we decided we needed to really go for it. Because based on the statistics I mentioned earlier, you can see what an incredible force American women are as a consumer. Um, and having worked in that field before, um, when I went to women.com, it became a top 30 website. And um, I launched the site that included a bunch of Hearst magazines and also Bloomdale magazines as well. So I was very familiar with the for profit publishing model, right? Um, and so we decided we would go as a dot com and we decided to incubate a quality publishing syndicate approach. And I had actually done this before. I launched uh, the Law.com blog network for American Lawyer Media with Ball of Conspiracy and others in November of 2004. And that's the first one I'm aware of. After that, I consulted to Glam Media. Today, there was sort of a, a blog network of fashionistas, and then decided to do blog.com, because while I love Heidi and lipstick, I get to think about that for one hour a week. So blogger.com was born, and our goal was really to create opportunities for all women in blog, and we're trying to figure out how to work it all together. We started with 26 blogs that we incubated, um, and, excuse me, 34 blogs that we incubated in June of 2006. Um, all of them were parenting blogs because we knew that we had to really focus on a target demographic. The problem with going out to tell a story is you have to be succinct, particularly with advertisers. Um, and parenting blogs are really an untapped market. And these women were the best things I'd ever read as a parent. And again, I'm the only co-founder who's parent, so I decided I could, I could figure it out. So um, we launched them. We sold out almost immediately. <laughs> and advertisers said to us, if only you were 10 times bigger. And so we developed a site called bloggerads.com, this time paying the Drupal group uh, that had developed our first site. Um, and in September of 2006, we launched um, Blogger Ads and grew from 34 blogs to about 160. And then we had to immediately shut down the network in six weeks because we had so much demand. And we, we had one saleswoman, my partner, Jordan. So then we started to get really serious about thinking, okay, what's going to happen here? And what we didn't like was there were other blog networks that had started, and they insisted that the women who participated in their networks be huge. Excellent blogs. These networks are fantastic blogs. But they, they have to be of a certain size to participate. And we really felt like our mission was to create an opportunity for all women in the blog to figure out a way to make a better dollar, right? So we didn't like that. Um, and we decided we would try to hire on a couple of sales contractors, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, we decided we needed to either go for it big or pull it back and, and only do the conferences. And so we decided to um, accept uh, a minority venture capital investment. And as, this is my fourth job with a company that is venture capital funded. And you know, venture capital is not my favorite thing. But we uh, got really, really lucky this time. We decided to accept uh, an investment from David Seminole. And he's a guy who launched Spark Networks, which owns JDate and American Singles and Capital Date and OBS Date, for really the online consumer. Um, and he also owns um, Fortinfo.com, which is a mobile device. And finally, we found someone who could talk about the consumer likelihood and could really understand what we are going for here. And it's been a wonderful experience. We're really, really happy with it. Um, and I think that the best advice I ever got about a decision on that regard came from Catherine Fay, the co-founder of Flickr. She told me and Elisa Camport, remember, people first, terms second, valuation third. She said, 
If you love the people, you'll come up with reasonable terms, and the valuation will be worth it. If you don't, the inverse will be 